to introduce our speaker today, I couldn't be more excited. Um, Steve Foster is a leader of men. His current calling is as a pitching coach for the Colorado Rockies. We're just fortunate that he married a Wausau girl in the off season. Lives in Wausau. He's been on the tour. Wausau on Tuesday lacrosse yesterday and here today. And he drove up from lacrosse this morning. And I told him when he got here, it's, it's just proves that no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> But we want to give a really warm Chippewa Valley welcome to our speaker today, Steve Foster. Thank you. So I got here early, I left really early, the, the weatherman in the cross at 5.03 a.m. this morning used the word dicey. The weather, if you're traveling north or west, is dicey. So I quickly hopped out of bed, showered, and hit the road and did beat some of the snow. But it started getting interesting uh, for a Texan who's lived up here for about 15 of my last 30 years. So I have adapted some, but I'm not comfortable with what I just drove through. Um, it was an exciting morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I have traveled some in Eau Claire. Uh, I'll get to my family, but I'm going to start by reading this quote right here. A man leaves all kinds of footprints when he walks through life. Some you can see, others are invisible, like the prints he leaves across other people's lives. And we all leave prints, footprints, whether we're wearing cleats, boots, whatever we wear in life. Uh, you know, I love the hunting up here. I love tracking deer. And I love that the fact that when you get snow, you can follow them just about anywhere. It's a fact, though, wherever we go in life, we leave prints. And for me in my life, I've used these things right here to leave footprints with the people that uh, I've been blessed to be around in my life. And I'm going to share a little bit about that with you today. Um, if you know this guy right here, this is a guy named Ralph Gar. He's a leadoff hitter in the major leagues for many years. For the Atlanta Braves, the Chicago White Sox, the California Angels. This dude right here could hit. And this is the way he looked when he hit. When he got to the plate, he would get down low and that bat would move and it would be just like this. And one day, he was leading off in a major league game against a guy named Nolan Ryan. Right? The Ryan Express. Not the Eau Claire Express. The Ryan Express. This brother brought Ched, 97 to 102, thighs this big around, mean, the only pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball to throw seven no hitters. And he is leading off against him this one day. I learned this story from a guy named Dave Owen. Dave Owen was a coaching friend of mine for the Kansas City Royals. And Dave shared this story with me. Dave was a role player. Utility guy sitting on the bench watching this at bat. And Ralph Gar goes to the plate against Nolan that day. First pitch. Didn't move the bat. Right? Next pitch. Didn't leave the box. Next pitch. Never moved the bat. Strike two. Right? This is not Casey at the bat poem. Right? Here he is. Next pitch. Third pitch. Hee-haw! Strike three. Ralph goes back to the bench, sits down next to Dave Owen, and Dave Owen says, what's he got? <laughs> Ralph looks at him and goes, what? He goes, what's he got? He goes, what's he got? What's he got? This game is over. <laughs> three pitches. This game is over. Man, when Dave told me that story, I busted out laughing in the locker room, man. Three pitches, this game is over. I think Yogi Berra said it ain't over till the fat lady sings. He gets credit for it, I don't know. He, but he also said when you get to the fork in the road, take it. And he said 90% of the game is one half mental. I mean, who comes up with the things Yogi Berra said? But it ain't over until the last pitch is made. And there's 162 games in a season. I've been in the big leagues coaching uh, five years with the Rockies, three years with the Royals, 
three years with the Marlins. I was a player in the big leagues for three years. It's a grind. 162 games is long, and I got these three people as my backbone. My son has great cabbage. That's what I call that on his head. I got hair envy. This is Casey. Casey played uh, in the University of North Texas marching band. He was a tuba player that I'm very proud of. I didn't know anything about the marching band. I was proud of my son. And it was a, just a joy to watch him enjoy being a part of a marching band. Uh, the lady on his left shoulder is Corey. Uh, I met her when I was a Cedar Rapids Red coming up to play the Wausau Timbers. She was home from pharmacy school where she went to University of Wisconsin down at Madison. And she was home visiting her parents. Her dad was a Lutheran pastor for Mount Olive Lutheran. He had left Chippewa Falls where he was a Lutheran pastor for many years and then was called to Weston, Wisconsin to become a pastor there. Corey was home visiting her parents. We met, exchanged numbers. And both, by the way, I'm sure her parents were thrilled to death when, when she said, I'm going to Chattanooga to see Stephen and, and, uh, and then get married. And I know my parents, when I said, I'm moving to Wisconsin, my dad's like, are you kidding me? Dude, you're in Waxahachie, Texas. You don't move a thousand miles north if you're a baseball player. Have you lost your mind? And then we started having offspring and being married. And we've been married for 29 years, and half of that I've spent up here. This is my daughter. She's the starting shortstop for the Wisconsin Badgers. So if you followed the Badger softball team this last year, they were really good. And I'll talk a little bit about her later. Uh, this article right here was written in 2017. Meet the guy with the worst job, not in baseball, in all of sport. You got to be kidding me. When he did this article, Tim Brown for Yahoo Sport, he failed to mention that he was gonna be, this was going to be the title for it. Because had he, I probably wouldn't have given him the time. Right? Worst job in all of sport. You know how I've been wearing that for two years? I still get emails. You know, it'll be a big picture of me, the guy with the worst job in all of sports, right? From who knows who? From friends, from enemies. But I, I still hear about it. I took this article and I've used it in my life and I've used it with our pitchers in Colorado because everybody in baseball, everybody knows that Hitting is wonderful in Denver. The air spin, the ball flies, we have big gaps, the outfielder's got a lot of room to cover. Everybody knows that. He didn't need to say this for people to know that, I, that people think I have the worst job in sport. I turned it and I took to our pitchers, I said, we're gonna, we're gonna do it a little bit different. It's why I was hired. It's why I left Kansas City and came to Colorado to help equip Young men to believe that they can do what that most people say can't be done. So we came up with this saying, altitude matters, not denying reality, but your attitude matters more. Defining for our pitcher's attitude, the patterns of your thinking, of your mind and your heart that are on display for others to see. Your teammates, the fans, the 10 year old at the end of the dugout, your manager, we don't stare down umpires when we don't get calls. We don't clear out the bat rack ah! and, and throw out an F-bomb for the 10-year-old to see. But we act like we're under control and have control of the game and everything that we say and everything that we do, and that's very important to me. We don't make excuses. So my dad and I in 2003, him being a little league coach for over 30 years, he had five children. So he has a lot of stories. I wrote in this book about my perspective of being a little league player, a college player, a junior college player, a minor league player, and a major league player. So it's got both of our perspectives in it. But in here, because I've been a pitching coach for a long time, I have the top 50 excuses of a pitcher. You're going to appreciate this one. Keith, I'm going to do this in less than one minute. You got a clock? Here we go. I do. Top 50 excuses of a pitcher in less than one minute. Listen up. It's too cold, it's too hot, it's too windy. They don't have a bullpen mound. My arm is sore, my catcher sucks. I need new spikes. I have a blister on my finger. There's a hole in the front of the mound. The mound is flat. The zone is tight. The ball feels heavy. Seems on the bar too big. I need a new pitchy toe. I can't see the catcher signs. The mound's too big. It has too big of a slope. My pants are too tight. My jersey's too loose. I can't pitch with this cup on. 
I ate too much for lunch. Rubber's too out. Rubber's too low. Rubber has a big hole. I have a wrong bubble gum. I need a new pitch. I need new mechanics. My rotary cup is sore. I can't grip the ball. The mount slippery. Mount too sticky. I can't spin the ball. My new underwear is chafing me. I hate running. Running's overrated. My girlfriend broke up with me last night. I can't pitch with this glove on. The catcher's calling wrong pitches. Can't get my fastball down. Can't get my change up up. The other team's ragging on me. My infielders make too many errors. They're hitting everything I throw up there. I can't keep my socks up. Feels too small. He's crowding the plate. Have a hang now. I'm constipated and I can't breathe through my eyelids. Woo! Mm. Number 50 is from Bull Durham, if you saw the movie. The other 49 I've heard. I've been a pitching coach a long time. Baseball is a game of excuses. We cannot tolerate and allow excuses in Colorado for pitchers to make excuses. Because you got the biggest excuse on the planet Earth already. Because you pitch on the moon, right? You pitch on the place that people say you can't pitch. So we don't allow excuses. So we narrowed it down to six things. Control the strike zone, control your emotion, control the tempo, control the count, control the running game, and control the four facets of pitching. Uh, change of speeds, movement, location, and velocity. So we take these six things and we say, we have the right attitude, the right mindset. And we're gonna narrow it down to these six things. We're gonna control the strike zone. You're gonna prove to me if you're gonna be a major league pitcher for the Denver, for the Colorado Rockies, that you can pitch in all four quadrants. When you need to, when the catcher sets up there, you've gotta be able to do it. You've gotta be, be able to do it with precision. Not perfection, but precision, and there's a difference. Controlling your emotion, I kind of already gave you an idea what that looks like and what we expect. Controlling the tempo during spring training, we take a stopwatch. We hold them accountable, 8 to 12 seconds between each pitch. From the time the ball leaves your hand to the time you tow the rubber to get ready for the next pitch. We don't tolerate you dragging your butt to make everyone else drag theirs. Uh, controlling the uh, count. 001122 counts, even counts, action pitch counts. It are not strike to ball pitches. You're not throwing your filthy curveball or your changeup that fades off in 001122 pitches. The difference between 01 and 10 is enormous. We know that. The difference between 2-1 and 1-2, enormous. But the biggest difference and the greatest hitting count in baseball, all people know that are in baseball, is the 3-2 count. So the 2-2 two -two count is very important for a pitcher that it's not an action pitch. The only time that changes is when the game's on the line and there's runners on base in scoring position. And you have a relief pitcher that has filthy stuff, he could leave the zone in even counts. But our starters are taught, control the count. Also controlling the running game, varying our times and looks to the plates, making sure that we know and do the picks the way that we teach it. We, we have what we call a one-piece pick and a load and go, which we teach all of our pitchers. And the four facets as well, being able to control all the things that you have to do to command the baseball. In 1993, um, at the end of May, I was leading the National League in appearances and I was leading the National League in ERA just above Greg Maddox. I was uh, being used frequently by Tony Perez, our new manager who followed Lou Pinella. And uh, when we flew to Los Angeles, I was asked to be on the Jay Leno show. And I'm thinking when I got the call, somebody's up to something, you know. I got some guy. I'm thinking Eric Davis. I'm thinking one of our veterans on our team. But, you know, I'm, I'm in my third year and I was doing well. My, my career was moving this way and I'm thinking, Maybe Jay Leno really wants me on his show. <laughs> so I'll go for this. So I tell our public relations guy I'm in. So just the next day, a big black limousine pulls into the hotel with the Tonight Show on the side of it. And I jumped in and it took me down to Burbank, California at two o'clock in the afternoon and I went on the Tonight Show. And Jay said what he was gonna do when I met him, I'm gonna do man versus machine. I'm gonna have a major league pitcher, that's you, throw and knock down the mid midway bottles, right? Everybody's done this, you've been to a carnival and you've had the balls and you've knocked over the six bottles. So in the rehearsal, I take the ball and just blow the bottles up and think, okay, I'm a major league pitcher, I can handle this, right? Wrong. So, and the real deal's coming, right? And I'm standing in back with Mike Richards, Kramer from Seinfeld. He's on the show that night too. Tall, you know, the tall hair slides into the room. 
So I'm standing behind the curtain and I'm watching Jay do this on the monitor and he walks up in the monologue and he talks to a young lady with a little top on. And I'm like, I'm watching this, I'm like, something's up. He didn't tell me he was gonna do that in rehearsal. So he's talking to this young girl and he says, do you think a major league pitcher can knock over the bottles quicker than a pitching machine? She goes, oh yeah, major league pitcher. He goes, bring out Steve Foster. So he opened the curtain and out I walked. And I'm like, oh my God, right? I pissed in front of 40, 50,000 people in a major league game, but this is a little different deal. I'm knocking over bottles with uh, Jay Leno and the world watching. No hitter, right? So I take the ball and I throw it and knock down five of the six. I'm like, okay, I can live with that. I won't take too much heat from the guys back in the clubhouse. Throw the next one, miss it. Throw the third ball, knock down the bottle. So I knock down all six. And I turn around and Jay has picked this girl up and is running down the steps with her and boom, puts her right in my arms. Now I've been married for three years. <laughs> And I'm on national television with a girl with a little top, and I'm thinking, I'm dead. <laughs> and I just turned around, walked off the stage with her, they opened the curtains, and then I dropped her, and I'm thinking, I called my wife immediately. No cell phones back then. I used Mike Richards' phone. And I said, I, we've got a problem. I, Jay didn't tell me he was going to do this. But the story is this. The next day, I pitched two innings that night against the Dodgers. Uh, did well, no problems. But the next day we flew to San Fran and I went to get up in the game and my shoulder was killing me. And some guy, in, I went on the DL and some guy in San Francisco wrote, Foster Hurt on Leno Show. And it still shows up in the 10 wackiest injuries in the history of all sport. Uh, Foster Hurt on Leno Show. It's not true. I wasn't hurt, but it, like my dad said, if it keeps your name going, that's great. Let him read it. <laughs> um, I did have to find direction after that, though, because my career was over. And remember, I said it was, it was moving this way, and it was just done. So I went to the two people who I trusted the most, my father and my grandfather. My father, Steve Foster Sr., said, son, you need to finish your degree. I signed as a junior into pro baseball, which I did. I coached at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 1997 and 98, where we went to the College World Series for the first time in school history and then lost in the regional the second year. Um, my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, Kenneth Bryant, um, he told me on the island of Okinawa that he had things that helped keep him alive. And the first thing he said was his faith in God. The second thing he told me was his Bible. And the third thing he told me was he had a personal mission statement. Now, when I've shared that with most men, and I've shared it with many, most people don't even think about that. You know, you work for an organization, you work for a school, you know, wherever you're at in life. And they, you, your companies usually have a mission statement. But my grandfather said that his personal mission statement was what helped keep him alive along with his faith in God and his Bible. So for me, I took my Bible and I came up with five things that I found in the Bible that, I beca that it became a part of my mission statement in life. And I'm going to share this with you today. And that is, encourage others. Came from 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. Now, each one of us has the opportunity in our lives to encourage or discourage in just about every choice that we have in our life. There's nothing better than being a bow hunter in the state of Wisconsin. And I know there's some bow hunters in this room. But there's nothing better than sitting and being up in a tree, being alone, it being quiet, and you hearing, ha, ha, and you look up and you see that right there. It's a powerful moment, man. It's, it's awesome. But, you know, in my life, when I think of my family and I think of the teams I've played on, this is what it looks like. Every once in a while, you've got to get the big hit. You've got to make the pitch. You've got to be the windbreaker. But most of the times in life, you're a honker, man. You're a honker. Ha! 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 And in life, as a teammate, as a father, it's not honking, but it's keep going, 
Keep going. I love you. I love you. That's what an encouragement is. And it's a choice. And for me, my grandfather said he had a personal mission statement. I started, I picked five E's and the first E I picked was encourage people. And that's what I've done in my life from the time I was 27 to the time I'm 53 as a big league coach. Every day, these five E's are a checklist for me, an accountability for me. That when I lay my head on the pillow at night, it's, did I get anything done today? Did I accomplish anything? And this is the first thing that I do is, did I encourage anyone? The second thing is edify. And that came from Romans 15, 2 that says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Now build ourselves up. It's a lot, you know, in baseball, there's a whole lot of this going on. Not a whole lot of this going on. Not turning the M over to the W, the me to the we. The we teams are the special teams. The we families, where it's not all about one person. It's we, not me. And I learned that from the E of edify. I've taught many coaches in my life the, what my dad called the law of edification. The law of edification goes something like this. He was a will auditor for Dallas County probate. He worked at the corner of Houston and Elm. And this motorcade right here with JFK came north on Houston, turned left on Elm, and Lee Harvey Oswald was somewhere up here in the book depository. And my dad's office for many years was on the second floor that looked right there. So a lot of people would come to my dad's office and say, Steve, can I just stand here for a moment? Can I just look out your window? And he said a lot of times they'd end up sitting down and it would give him the opportunity to edify Judge Judy, De Judy DeShazo, who was his judge. And not only edify her, but edify the people that he worked with. Speak highly of, elevate when they're present and when they're not in the room. He said, and he told me, if you will do this for the people that you work for and that you work alongside of, because you're always going to have, as a coach, there's going to be one coach putting down that coach over there, and there's going to be a player here putting down that player over there. He said, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. And call people out when they're doing it. Edify. Elevate. Lift people up. The most powerful thing you can do in a company, in a business, is teach your employees. Or if you're an employee that doesn't own a company, is to edify your boss. And edify those that you work alongside of and let them catch you doing it. It's powerful and it serves you well. The third thing is engage. These five guys right here have been our starters for the last three or four years. We've been to the playoffs two of the last three. Uh, you know because we played the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, and we played some really great games. Maybe if you're a Chicago Cub fan in the room. And I bet you there's a few. You don't have to recognize yourself. <laughs> but Cubby fans are everywhere. Uh, we played the 13 inning wild card game two years ago, if you remember that one, two to one in the 13th inning. Sorry about that Cub fan. But for you Brewer fans, y'all have had our number two of the last three years, but we, we paid you back this past year when you were uh, going strong into the playoffs and we knocked you off and made you the wild card team. So we've had some good battles. Um, but these five count on me being engaged. And engaged I found in the Bible when I looked it up for another E. This is what happened. Jesus early in the morning, while still dark, Mark 1, 35 through 39, got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. I find that kind of funny. All right. Just personally. But Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. Now, check this out. These are the dudes that were with Jesus every day. And they know he goes and prays in the morning alone. All right. So what's the big shock there, Peter? Peter always has to open his mouth. If you know God's word, if you know the Bible, this dude speaks up. You got to love Peter. He's the go getter. But he's like, Jesus, where are you? We're looking for you. You know, I'm thinking Jesus would go, really? I'm the son of God and I'm. Kind of talking to my father. Do you mind? But Jesus didn't do that. He said, simply, let's go. 
Let's go. Because he's always, Jesus was always getting engaged with the people he was around. He was always getting to know people and loving on people and encouraging people. I have to do that with a bullpen coach. I have to do that with, this is our equipment manager. We call him Tiny. That ain't no tiny dude. But I got to spend a lot of time with him. I got to get to know him. I got to spend, you know, invest time, text, sit with, listen, engage. And this is our staff. We have to have fearless vulnerability, criticism with each other. We have to be able to, to take the criticism and give it and not take it personal. And that is so hard. This is Buddy Black. Great left-handed pitcher and a really good manager. Really good manager. Here's one way that I've seen him engage. Not with an upside-down video. That's pretty creative, man. Can you play that upside-down video? Check that out. I love Buddy. Man, cre you talk about creative... Have you ever stretched on a sports field and had a mariachi band play for you? I think it's awesome. Buddy comes up with ways to create and engage his players. And is that my time to go? No. Okay. Not Not <laughs> I know it was for you, for you earlier. Close. Mm. Check this out. There may be somebody in the room that heard about this or that was even there. I don't know. We're about to find out. 2005, I'm a minor league coach for the Florida Marlins. I decide, great idea. Let's have a baseball camp in January. Right? So I get, go up and talk to D.C. Everest. They have three gymnasiums, a huge school. And in two weeks, I had 175 kids from all over the state of Wisconsin signed up. I had all pro coaches. Ben Zobrist, who played for me over for the Woodchucks. Uh, I could, I, you know, his name was already getting big, so I had him coming. And all these kids show up. And, I, and four straight Sundays at D.C. Everest High School... We have all these kids, and their parents naturally have to drive them in because they came from all over the state. Some were from Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls. So we used one word on each Sunday. You know, uh, determination, passion, potential. And what we did as a group was all the things that we taught during the day were, were based off of that word. But we started in the auditorium, so all the parents, there were sometimes 500, 700 people. It started growing as the parents started spreading the word that we were having like an auditorium talk and answering tough questions with kids and parents about baseball and their dream, chasing their dream. So we use this word. So I got this, what I thought was a great idea. I thought, man, I'm, I'm taking, my word is potential. That's what I'm going to take. So <laughs> I call this dude that owns an exotic farm. And I'm thinking, man, I can engage these kids the way they've never been engaged. And I say to the guy that owns the exotic farm, listen, what kind of animals you got? He goes, oh, I got some great animals. I said, what do you got? He goes, I got a yak. I said, a yak? Like the hairy cow? He goes, yeah. I said, I'll take it. He goes, you can't. We can get, hang on. What, what are you going to do with him? It's a fair question, right? <laughs> I'm thinking... I just need him to come inside and stand on the, on the, uh, up at, in a stage in an auditorium. He goes, no, 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 no. You can't take a yak inside. He starts laughing at me. Said he's never been inside. No. I said, well, what else you got? He goes, I have a zebra. I said, I'll take it. He goes, no, the zebra's never been inside either. I said, well, then you tell me what you have that can go inside. He goes, I got a camel. Right? So... I got the camel. <laughs> so this is how the story goes. And this is absolutely... I had eyewitnesses in the last two places that I talked because I had guys that were there that, that helped teach. But this is what happened. I tell the dude that owns the camel, that has the camel on a leash, when I say this word, camels, now camels have potential. And I pump my fist. They're going to open up the curtain and you, you just walk out with the camel, get him down on his knuckles. I'll climb on him 
and I'll finish my talk on a camel. Now that's potential, right? I'm thinking, this is going to reach these kids. <laughs> but here's what happened. In the rehearsal, I say, now a camel has potential. And they open up the curtain. And then back into this camel, diarrhea shot 10 feet. <laughs> and man, it went like this. That's what it sounded like. And I turn around. And it was, oh man, it, you know, it was automatic, just wanting to puke. First of all, you can't imagine what camel diarrhea looks like. <laughs> Second of all, you can't even come close to imagine what it smells like. They told me D.C. Everest auditorium stunk for two years. And I mean, I was on my hands and knees scrubbing. I called my wife to get the kids out of bed, get up here, get every cleaning agent, get buckets, get mops. And I mean, where are my kids, man? My kids are little, we're all in there just doing all we can to get this. We got it cleaned up in time, just in time for the camel. He told me he had opened it up and he cleaned himself out that it was safe. He goes, but you can't get on him, all right? You can't get on him. I said, well, you don't have to worry about that. I do not want to get on that camel. <laughs> but I said, we can still use the shock factor. Engage these kids. So I did it. It opened up and he walked out. He did end up eating a page of my notes. He reached around, grabbed a page of my notes, which I, I used as part of the talk like it was supposed to happen. But it, that's how I chose to engage those players. And I think using my third E of is engage is important in our lives. The fourth E for me is equipping people that I'm around. For me, it's my players. Preparation prevents panic. Information is only information without application and understanding. Otherwise, I could just hand these pictures a book and say, here, take the information. But I got to have application and understanding. Most of the pictures that I teach can finish most of these sentences because I say them so much. I can say to Herman Marquez, preparation, he'll go, prevents panic, poppy. That's what he'll say to me. Demonstrate the right way. See it, feel it, trust it comes from Goff's Sacred Journey, the seven days of utopia. It's a great and real thing when a player visualizes seeing it, feeling it, and trusting it before it ever happens. Faith or fear, they're both a choice. These are things that I teach and train in equipping my players. They work in a family. They work in a business. They work in uh, athletics. A grateful heart rejects depression. That's a powerful thing to teach a young person. There's people right here in the room today that no doubt have, have in, in their lives anxiety and depression. 100% that there's people here in this room. And my heart goes out to you because I have people in my family, in my own family, that, that deal with this issue. And, I, and my encouragement to you is that a grateful, the perspective of which you look at, your vision, your lenses of life, turning the worries of this world into just simply being grateful for pumping the air that you're breathing. The small things in life. I read a book called The, the Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. And I've given out to over 500 of them. And they're a powerful, powerful tool to someone dealing with anxiety or depression. And I know that a grateful heart rejects depression. Discipline modeled and expected is something that I, I title discipline. I teach every player that I coach my definition of discipline, focused intent on doing the right thing even when it's uncomfortable. So if I go up to Cal Freeland and I say, one of our pitchers, give me the definition of discipline, he'd say focused intent on doing the right thing even when it's uncomfortable. He can say that. He knows it. But it's important not only in our families, not only in our teams and our companies, but it's important in life. It, it, for me, it's a part of what we can do in equipping younger people, older people, or anyone. And for me, I would like to share I, that I got this from Ephesians 2.10, which is one of my favorite verses, where God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So cool. Already prepared for us before we even begin. What a great thing when you're a follower of Christ. Um, this is in late May. 
And this is a game between the number one team in the nation that hadn't been beat at their home field in over two years. And the Cheeseheads, the Badgers, went down there. And this is a play in the game by my daughter. And if you would, play this play. Preparation prevents panic. See it, feel it, trust it. Discipline, focused intent on doing the right thing. I've seen Lauren make that catch so many times in our front yard. We have a front yard that angles up. She'll go out for passes and I'll just throw it. She'll catch it over her shoulder on the run, do a drop step and throw it back to me. I've seen this catch so many times. Preparation prevents panic. It doesn't matter if you're playing the number one team that's never been beat on their field or not. Great players anticipate. Great players. I've been fortunate enough in my life to coach at the elite, the top level. Great pitchers anticipate. Great hitters anticipate. And anticipation comes from preparation. Preparation prevents panic. If I've already run through it in my mind, and I've run through it in my mind, and, and great athletes do it like that. They already think, okay, if the ball's hit here, I'm going to do that. If the ball's hit there, I'm going to do this. If it's hit short, I'm going to charge. I'm not going to wait back. A pitcher already thinks, if I locate the ball there and I, and, I, and I hit it on the end, and I get that slider right where I want it, this is a result that's going to happen. It's amazing how many times it, it works, right? It's amazing to me. Equipping our players. This is a horse, and I'm going to tell you about this horse because i got a little bit of time. Muhammad ruled the Arab world centuries ago. It's fact. He ruled it because of the way he taught discipline. And discipline for him was very important as it is in the, in the faith of Islam. No doubt. 100%. Do your homework. You should know this. I should know it. Because many of the countries in the Arab world are the most disciplined people in the world. And Muhammad went out back outside of his tent and he looked and he saw depleted horses. And he got the leader of his army and he brought him in and he said, I want you to take 50 of your best men and you've got a year I want you to find 100 of the finest horses. And history records this is exactly what he did. The leader of his army walked in just at a year and said, Sir, your horses are in back. He said, Great. And for a year, Muhammad did only one discipline with these horses. When he pulled out the shofar, the ram's horn, All 100 horses would run right to his feet. All 100. Every day for a full year, he taught him one discipline. When he blew the horn, run to my feet, come to me. At the end of that year, Muhammad took the leader of his army and he said, just 100 feet from the bubbling brook down there out back, I want you to build me a stable just big enough for all 100 horses. History records he got it built in a day. And he got all 100 horses in that stable. And for three days and three nights, he didn't give them one drop of water or one bit of food. And history records on the fourth day, he and his army walked out back and he told the leader of his army, open the gate. And it was a stampede, history says. You can Google this. It was a stampede that had like never been seen before as those horses climbed over one another to get out that gate and down to the bubbling brook. And just as the lead horse almost got to the water, Muhammad pulled out the horn and went, and only one horse, one, stopped and went back to the master's call. 
And with that one horse, he bred the breed of horses known as the Arabian horse that is still one of the finest horses in the history of this world. Discipline. Discipline and the importance of discipline. Because when a hunger, when we're so selfish and we want things our way, when, when we go past me and it's about we, it's amazing what can be done. Discipline. The last D is empower. I love this picture, by the way. It's a great picture. That's a crazy goldfish or an empowered goldfish. I got empowered from Acts 1, 6 through 8, and it's my last E. Then they gathered around him, disciples around Jesus, and they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, whether you've been in church your whole life or you've never stepped one foot in a church, there's three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. For the believers that follow Christ, I'm a believer. I choose to follow Christ. I choose to share with my players. I don't shove it down anybody's throat. I just try to live it out daily and have conversation and engage. But when the Holy Spirit empowers us as believers in Christ, we don't have to worry about what people think about us. Because He empowers us to go. And share and teach and teach the world. It's no different with us as coaches, with the owner of a company, when you empower your employees. When a player feels the freedom of expression, I don't have to do it his way, I can do it my way. Freedom of expression. It's so powerful to empower our players as coaches. And it's so powerful for a company owner to empower his employees to be the very best they can be. Because see, nobody's made up like you. Nobody. Nobody has your thoughts. Nobody has your heart. Nobody has the way that you think through and go about things. And then when you're empowered, the things that you can do. On November the 2nd, 1863... It's the most famous speech in the history of the United States. What would you say that is? Gettysburg Address, right? Who gave it? Abraham Lincoln. And how long was it? Two minutes. The Gettysburg Address is two minutes long. Famous speech in the history of the United States. It signified the end of the Civil War. Right? Gettysburg Address has signified this game is over. <laughs> That's what it signified, but it never happens if this guy right here doesn't empower the 20th Maine. This is Joshua Chamberlain, an English teacher at Bowdoin College in Maine. And the South was winning the war on July the 2nd, 1863. It had driven them back and driven them back on the hill of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Driven them back. It was almost done. Historians say if this battle would have been lost, this battle, the Battle of Little Round Top, you can Google that. If the North loses the Battle of Little Round Top, historians say the South wins the war and this country today wouldn't be one country. It'd probably be two countries or three. But the choices of this guy... Sitting behind a stone wall with scared to death crying men who had been pushed back all day long. He tells them you only have one choice. We, have, we are out of ammunition. We're outnumbered five to one. And they knew it. Outnumbered five to one. Pushed all the way back to the top of the hill behind a stone wall. History records that Joshua Chamberlain stood up, put his muzzle and the, the bayonet in the end of the gun, stood up, faced the opponent who had driven him back all day, and went, charge! And those men, empowered by their leader, stood up and went over the wall into history. 
because the, the South couldn't believe it. <laughs> We've been driving them back all day, and here they come again. Many of them dropped their weapons. And there's pictures in history that show this battle where they got their hands tied behind their back and they kind of look shocked. <laughs> they realize we outnumbered these guys big time. But these guys fought for something that meant something. They knew what was going on was wrong. This guy followed a God who he believed in. And he empowered his men, the 20th Maine that day. Because look, if we weren't one strong nation under God today, when Hitler bounced from country to country, wiping them out, there wouldn't have been one superpower to stand in the way. And when Hirohito bounced from Pacific Island to Pacific Island, there wouldn't have been one superpower to stand in the way. I could keep going. Saddam Hussein, there's a whole lot of bad leaders in the history of this world. And we are one country under God. And his choice mattered. And so do yours. Everything matters. Your choice today, what you do with your life today, matters to people that you don't even know. The ties that bind. This is one of my favorite quotes by Andy Andrews. Life is like a game of Monopoly. You may own hotels on Boardwalk or you may be renting on Baltic, but in the end, it all goes back in the box. <laughs> That's cold. <laughs> but it's true. Whether you own all kinds of companies and you're filthy freaking rich, or you're the poorest person in here, it don't matter. When we all die, it all goes back in the box and nothing goes with us. This is what I know and what I want to close with. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. And for 4,000 years, everything pointed to the coming of a Messiah. In the 2019 years that have happened since the coming of that Messiah, everything's pointed back to that day. Even our calendars tell us that. It's a fact. What's recorded by people who lived and I witnessed him being on this planet. He came, he died, he was crucified on a Roman cross, he was resurrected, came back to life. And the people that witnessed it and saw it were willing to die for it, for what they believed. Now, a lot of us would die for what we believe. But who do you know that would die for what they don't believe? Pretty good argument. Pretty good argument if you do any type of history study in your life. These people died because they knew and they saw him alive after he died. That's powerful. And while Jesus was here, he said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. He also said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He said it. <laughs> it's a free gift. And every man, woman, and child is given. Here's your free gift. I love you so much, God said. I love the world so much. And every one of you I made exactly the way you are. Whether you're bald and chubby with a Texas draw, or you're tall and handsome and got the Wisconsin, hey, you guys. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He made you just the way you are. For His purpose and for His glory. I can't tell you how overjoyed I am to get to share truth with grace. Can't share truth without grace. You got to have undeserved kindness. And I love you. And it's my pleasure to get to travel here through snow and share truth with you. And I hope one day you might consider becoming a Colorado Rocky fan. <laughs> you going to have another Rocky in here next month? Just keep bringing them, King. Right? 
Consider two things, okay? Consider having a personal mission statement that holds you accountable to daily. Did I get anything done today? And secondly, consider where Jesus fits into your life. And if he is, is he just a box that you check every day? Got my Jesus in? Got my whatever in? Check, check, check. No. Jesus wants to be integrated in every part of our lives. And I would ask that you would consider that as I do every day as well. I'm a sinner saved by grace just like you. Don't look at me. Don't point to me. I'll let you down. I promise you. Point to Him. Consider Him. Thank you.